You are listening to the Legends Lingo Podcast, brought to you by CouchGuysSports.com. With your host, Al. Buddy, you were targeted six times. You caught two receptions and did nothing else. Powder. Yes, sir. And Fiesta. He hasn't done jack. They've won one cup and they made a lot of playoff attempts. But he is a snake, an oily snake. He's a crook. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Legends Lingo Podcast, episode 107, brought to you by Couch Guy Sports. Make sure you check everything out from all our great blogs, all our great podcasts. Check out our store. Check it all out. We have great people, great lineups, just fantastic. How's it going, Al? How's it going, Powder? How are you doing on this great snowy Tuesday? Can't complain. Had a half day today, half day Friday, no school Monday. I'm living life. You you seem like you got a pep in your step tonight. Kind of like it. Yeah, I love it. Love to hear feel all excited, especially on a night like this. So just for just for everybody that uh, to understand what's going on, this is Fee's last episode for now. We'll see what happens in the future. It's his night. He gets to, he's running the show. He's doing everything. So that's why he did the intro, and that's why he will be the host for tonight. So Fee, I'm sorry. I just wanted to explain what's going on. Back to you. All right, so we'll just get right into it with Roll Call. Um, If you missed it over the weekend, Trevor Bauer signs with the Los Angeles Dodgers, a three-year, $102 million deal. Wowzers uh, on that one. $40 million this year and forty five million next year for annual uh, ABB, if you're following that, baseball nerds. We'll get into that a little bit. I want I want your thoughts on that. Um, also... If you weren't watching the game on Sunday, the Buccaneers won uh, Super Bowl 55, 31-9. TB12, Tom Brady wins his seventh Super Bowl and fifth MVP, uh, Super Bowl MVP, both continuing, uh, extending his records for that. So exciting stuff. Uh, what do you want to start with tonight, boys? Whatever you want. This, this is your episode, bud. This is all you. I mean, I, I'm just – I'm being – you asked me to be the host. I'm yeah. asking my and a good host knows what to do first, Mr. Fassett. <laughs> let's no, go. No, he asked first. He asked first because he's a gentleman. Oh, right. oh th- let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's start with what happened on Sunday. Let's talk about Super Bowl 55. Let's talk about your reactions, your thoughts, everything that went into that. Uh, we'll start with uh powder. What did you thought of the game? Initial thoughts, just like spill it all out. So I was listening to PMT yesterday, and I kind of agree with what they said where it was a boring Super Bowl, but never felt boring because of how good the Chiefs normally are. You could definitely tell Mahomes was injured. He was definitely hampered by his foot, and he wasn't able to move around. You could see him in his offensive line from the couple guys being out either by injury or COVID. You could tell his offensive line was Swiss cheese. Just Bucks were able to run through him all night long. So – you just felt like the whole game that the Chiefs are just also going to turn it on and they're going to make it a one score game in five minutes. Like they're going to score two touchdowns like that and just be right back in it. And it was going to be a contest. So that's why the game never felt boring. But if you, if it was anybody else besides the Chiefs and it was a score like that, I feel like it would have been a very boring Super Bowl. But you just, like I said, you felt like the Chiefs were going to have that couple drives where they put together. Tyreek Hill was shut down really the whole game. Didn't really have any big explosive plays. You felt like he was going to break one off. So it was a good game. I was happy. I always was rooting for the Bucks, But to see it kind of like Mahomes hurt and stuff like that, I wanted Bray to win, but you want to see it with everybody at 100%. percent Al, Kind of agree with you, Powder. I mean, that that was sort of the main thing is like, the game itself was sort of mad because of obviously the score and obviously because let's just face it, the Bucks dominated that game from every which way. The tight ends were better. The quarterback was better. The lines were better. Both offensive and defensive line, I think, were better. Defensive line was putting pressure on Mahomes the whole night. I think you guys saw it. He like rushed for over 497 yards, just like scrambling around. Yeah. And then the and then the Bucks offensive line gave Brady all the time in the world to throw. So 
to me, it's just a Super Bowl where you're glad that Tom Brady gets a seventh, especially as us as Patriots fans. But you kind of wish that it would have the Chiefs would have put up a little bit more of a fight on the scoreboard. And obviously the turf toe was an issue too. So, but overall, happy for TB12, happy for the GOAT. So, not much more you can say. Um, my thoughts, I thought this was a snooze fest. It, was, it got very boring to me. Right. I thought that we didn't, I mean, I don't think a lot of podcasts or a lot of the networks did a very good job. They underplayed the injuries of the Chiefs' two tackles. Yeah. I think that came out to be a big factor. You said it, Mahomes, I think, ran for over 500 yards running around the football field. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, like, the minute he snapped the football, he would, like, White, JPP, uh, Levante Davis, Barrett, well, all in the backfield. Every play, it felt like somebody was in the backfield less than two seconds or less than He's two He's usually seconds. 10 yards back to start. Yeah, yeah. So it felt like it, it really felt like the Chiefs weren't – it really felt like they weren't focused. And I mean, they were in the news for some negative things um, with Andy Reid's son um, for that. But I do think that, yeah, Mahomes' injury had a factor, but it felt like they just weren't prepared. It felt like they botched the game plan, and it, it just wasn't sharp. They felt It felt like they had hit a setback because they were supposed to be the next dynasty. I will say this, it, Mahomes will get there again. They'll win another Super Bowl, but I think we can end the discussion, the GOAT discussion. Brady's the GOAT. Can we agree with that? Oh, yeah. a, a thousand percent. I mean, now that now even the discussion for Brady is now, is he the greatest athlete in North American history or in, in all sports? That's another debate for another day. Um, but I will say this, it just felt that they, that it's a culmination. You got to feel happy for Brady. But again, it was kind of a snoozer and it felt like the Chiefs kind of took a hit a little bit and it, it was a little disappointing um, on that. I was hoping for a good game in, in that sense, but I will ask you this because we're going to kind of tie it in with the Patriots now. Does Bill Belichick's legacy take a hit? Does it take a hit? Does his pedigree uh, take a hit because of this? Because Tom Brady won, Tom Brady won a Super Bowl and brought his guys, Antonio Brown, Gronk, Leonard Fournette, and others to Tampa Bay, and they won a Super Bowl, not in year two, but year one. Does that take a hit on Bill Belichick's legacy? I think it does. And I think just because of all the points you said, Fee, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. Tom Brady took a team that went seven and nine the year before that had Jameis Winston as their starting quarterback who threw 30 interceptions, brought along a Hall of Fame caliber tight end, a wide receiver that was one of the best wide receivers in the NFL for a short period of time. And he had some had some troubles off the field. We all know that. He had some other good weapons with Godwin and Evans, Cameron Braid, OJ Howard before he got hurt. So he turned that around. You go from a seven to nine franchise to a Super Bowl winning franchise. That's not just a coincidence, especially if Bruce Arians as a coach. Happy for Bruce Arians. Congratulations on your Super Bowl win. But yes, Bill Belichick, until he wins it again, if he ever wins it again, I think his legacy does take a little bit of a hit. Yeah, I definitely agree with Al. I from one from some stuff I hear, a lot of the Tampa Bay players now are going to do the Patriots effect and take less money so they can keep building around them and keep winning. So I heard Mike Evans already is talking about taking less money, restructuring his deal, so they can get more weapons and just load back up so they can do it again. Which I think that hurts Bill Belichick because everybody thought that's just the way the Patriots were, but no, I think it's the way. Tom Brady is, and it has an effect on all the players around him. And now all our free agents are going to want to go to Tampa because they want to play Brady and not come to New England and play under Belichick because they realize it was Brady who won all those Super Bowls, not Belichick. Um, I'll I'll say this. It it is a damn it. It's a hit. I think the, I mean, the Patriots will still sign free agents, but I think they're going to have to, they're going to have to pay market price a little bit above if they want premier talent. I mean, that's going to be the case uh, from now on. I will say this. It's just, I mean, like Brady did that. And then like Sunday, 
Gronk with those two TDs, the ghost of Rob Gronkowski, because he's not the same tight end like he used to be, scores two touchdowns and turned back the clock a little bit. It was a gut punch. I will say this. Forget about Deshaun Watson. Forget about um, any other potential quarterback moves or headlines. The the offseason headline is, how's Bill Belichick going to respond to this? And I think that is going to be the the response. Is Are they going to go stick with the plan and have a rebuild, or is this going to be a faster retool? Because there needs to be a plan. And, I mean, that's going to be something that we're going to see probably very quickly, to be honest, that we're going to see a very strong indication. I don't know if you got any additional thoughts on that. The only thing that scares me a little bit is that the Jets are rumored to be going after Juju Smith-Schuster and Will Fuller, two guys that you could use on your team, especially as a number one receiver. Now, granted, they're just rumors, obviously, but you're seeing teams like the Jets be aggressive. You know other teams are going to be aggressive this offseason. You have to be just as aggressive. You have the cap space. You have the number 15 pick use them to your advantage and get back on a winning track. Yeah. agree hundred percent. Just go out and get a weapon or two on offense. The defense probably needs a player or two, but the defense is definitely in better shape than the offense. So focus on the offense and retooling it. Uh, I agree with you guys on that. Any other football notes before we move on? No, I think we're good. Just real quick. Oh. Do, were you guys, cause obviously this was a big topic on the internet. So, were you guys at all, like, how do you feel about cheering for Tom Brady even though he wasn't on the Patriots? Because I know a lot of people on Twitter are like, you're not a true Patriots fan if you enjoyed Tom Brady winning. He brought you six Super Bowls. Like, yeah. get over it. That's exactly how I feel. <laughs> I, I, I do have an opinion of that. Of that. If people say, oh, if you root for Brady, you should root for Brady or not. I feel like it's media just uh, trying to do a, a piss, piss contest. He is the greatest Patriot player ever. He brought you six rings. You can cheer for him. It's okay, fans. Yeah, it's okay. It's not like it's not like when the Bruin when the Bruins traded Ray Bork and Ray Bork came back with the Stanley Cup and they cheered fist for him. It's not that kind of pathetic. But it's okay to cheer and say congratulations to the greatest quarterback ever. And it's also it's okay to criticize Bill Belichick and say, okay, buddy, where's the plan? Yeah, where's the plan? Because you. Because because I won't fault him on this, and I, I, then we'll move on. When they drafted Garoppolo, they kind of said, "We're going to move on from Tom one day, and and be prepared." But then Tom Brady, and that and that's okay because at the end of the day, it's just like you have he's thirty seven years old. You don't think he was going to be bionic man and just continue to be elite, and you got three rings out of it because of that decision. That actually might be one of the greatest off greatest off-season decisions in NFL history because you won three Super Bowls because of it. But also, it just comes back to it's hindsight. Why didn't you just invest in Brady? But also, not only that, we can rip Bill all we want, but talk about the other teams. How about only two teams? Two teams. Who were interested in Tom Brady? Like, <laughs> seriously. Because they're moronic. The yeah. other teams are I mean, moronic. You want me to throw out the teams that are interested but never didn't pull the trigger? Colts, Raiders, Saints, Niners, Bears. Shame on the Colts, especially who they are a team that is literally a quarterback away. Yeah. They they chose Philip Rivers over Tom Brady. Yeah. <laughs> that's all yeah, that's, that's right. all you need to know. That's all you need yeah. to know. Yeah. All right. We're done with football. Let's move on to uh some brewing slots. Uh I'll start with you guys. What's your thoughts, especially the last couple of games against the Flyers or the comeback? So the comeback kid Bruins, they are. Thoughts on the season so far? Thoughts on especially the last two games that they played? Right now, they look like the best team in the NHL. Because they're winning in all aspects, right? And you just talked about it. They're coming back from deficits. Granted, I think all Bruins fans can agree they don't want this to be every game. But it's kind of cool to see a few of a few comeback wins. That's always nice. But David Posternak comes back, records a hat trick. One of the best young players in the NHL. This team is only going to get better. That's the scary part. They're going to get better, and they're going to look like a true contender coming out of the Eastern Conference. Yeah, I agree. Just them being 8-1-2, just winning games, like both of you said, on all aspects. 
playing good D and um, just finding ways to win is just great to see as a Bruins fan. And hopefully they can stay hot and stay healthy so that come playoff time, they can keep this rolling. I will say this. If you're, I mean, they're, they're red hot. And I think the obituaries that were written in December, especially after Chara left, uh, yeah. <laughs> were, were, pre, were premature. But if you're looking at the Canadian division, the North division, you if you're a hockey fan, just a sports fan in general, you have to be rooting right now for a Bruins Canadians or a Bruins Maple Leaf Stanley Cup Finals. That would be that, incredible. That not only just incredible and just like great uh, theater, but you just have to root for that. And I think the Dude. NHL is like the, the ratings and the money would be through the roof. We're talking about real dough here. Because if there's a league that's struggling with dough, it's the NHL because of the pandemic. They need that. They need that. All right, we're going to move on to the – you want to talk Red Sox or Celtics, or you want to get to that uh, – have a message for us, Al? You know what, Fee? I think it's time for a message because guess what? It's winter time, And guess what? Hey, fellas, we're in the thick of winter, and there's a storm brewing outside. We've been getting snow. There's been snow days for some people. There's a lot coming down. And it looks like there's one to three inches that are in the forecast. When you trim that hibernation bush that's taking place in your pants. Luckily, our partners, that's right, the Legends Legal Podcast is sponsored by our friends at Manscaped. Manscaped specializes in products to make sure you're walking around town with beautiful snowballs. Manscaped is here to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. And it offers precision engineered tools. Say it with me. For your family jewels. The Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer is the best hygiene tool for the modern man or woman if you decide to use it. Because of their ceramic blade and advanced skin safe technology, your snags on your snowballs will be reduced. The trimmer is also waterproof, so you can trim in the shower or jacuzzi if you're that much of a savage. I don't recommend it, but you do you. Manscaped performance performance package is the best buy of 2021. The performance package comes with the new and improved Lawnmower 3.0, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag. As you can see, powder's holding up the Weed Whacker, and it really works extremely well. Have you ever noticed how nasty nose and ear hair is? In fact, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. You don't want that coming out of your nose and looking like a forest. Might as well use the best tools to do the job because this bundle also comes with the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner as powder is going to get it up for us right there. Look at that bottle. Look at that packaging. The Crop Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant that makes your balls smell nice and make you feel like your testes are walking in a winter wonderland. The Crop Reviver is a spray-on toner for your balls. It's made with soothing aloe and witch hazel extracts that will make your balls look up at you and say, hey, thanks for that. Don't get cold feet this winter. Get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code LLP at manscaped.com. And they also have foot deodorant as powder is showing right there. Put it on your feet. It'll make your feet smell a lot better, especially mine. Mine are terrible. They also have a ton of other amazing men's hygiene products on their website from disposable mats for your pubes to foot deodorant to cologne as powder is holding up the cologne. You guys know Nick Qualia hasn't gotten the cologne yet. I was kind of shocked. It's kind of <laughs> funny too. We got it before you, Quags. Uh-huh. 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the promo code LLP. Again, that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use that promo code LLP. Thank you, Manscaped, for making our winter wieners look so good. And now back to the show. All right. So what do you want to go into next? Celtics, Red Sox, MLB notes. Uh, just going to Celtics. There's, we, we agree. There's not much on Red Sox. We can just go into Celtics. All right. So, I mean, we won't talk about Sunday because we expected that Sunday game to happen after what happened Friday. What is your thoughts on that Friday game against the Clippers? Carson Edwards, 16 points. It's sort of like a, just like a, a game that nobody expected him to come in normally. That's the spark they needed. Good for the Celtics for proving – that without Jalen Brown, they can go out and beat a top team in the West like the Clippers. That's a good win. But obviously, you're having the inconsistency right now because you can't stay healthy. So then you lose to the Kings. And like you said, we won't talk about it, but the Clippers win in itself, very impressive. Like if, if this was college basketball, that's a resume-boosting win right there. 
plain and simple. Yeah, like Al said, just a very impressive win over one of the top teams in the West, just proving that when you play and you're healthy, when the Celtics play in the healthy, they're very, very good. And they can beat anybody in the league. Uh, but obviously, yeah, like you said, inconsistency is killing them. They can beat good teams, but then sometimes fall to some not so good teams. Yeah, I agree. I think it was, I think another note is that Kawhi at he had the Kawhi versus Tatum thing. Tatum be Kawhi that night. Let's, let's be honest here. And it wasn't just on the offensive end. If you look at the defensive end, he kind of locked down Kawhi. Yeah. And that, that, oh, yeah. that is a good sign, especially when Tatum has taken a lot more of the offensive load and focus because um, he's a good defensive player. And he, th- th- that was expected this year. They would drop off a little bit because of the offensive attention and focus, but it's good that he can just flip that switch on that. And I agree. And I mean, even though they're two and two, it's still a successful road trip. They've had, you've seen things that are just good things. And I do have to ask because there were comments and rumors. We had Danny Ainge on Toucher and Rich say that the Celtics will probably use the TPE at the deadline and they want shooting with size. And then over the weekend, Kevin O'Connor of the ringer, said that the Celtics were blowing up a lot of executives' phones um, because they're up to something. Whatever that is, it is, but what's your initial thoughts on that? There are three guarantees in life. Death, taxes, and the Boston Celtics always being rumored to be up to something. I am so sick of hearing about this. They should use that trade that trade exception. I agree. Maybe you can look out in Washington. There's a guy that's unhappy named Bradley Beal. It's a pipe dream. But again, it's just, and as, and obviously people are watching on YouTube, I have my Celtic sticker in the background. I'm a diehard Celtics fan. It's unfortunate that I expect that they're not going to do anything. And if they do something, it's a surprise. Like that's where it's gotten to for me as a fan. I just show me, prove me wrong once, please. That's all. Yeah. I just, I want the Celtics to be aggressive at the deadline, find another piece because I think they really are one or two key pieces away from really truly contending in the East and being one of the best teams in the East. Um, so if Ainge can find a really good player like a Beal or someone like that, that can really put the Celtics over top, I think they really have a legit chance to win the East this year. I have some bad news, boys. Al, you better get up for this one. <laughs> I'm too, I'm too lazy to stand up right now, so just tell me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know. They don't need to go after a star. They, they don't. It's more of, and I said this in a series of tweets um, yesterday about the rumor. So this is the thing that they need to do. They have top-end talent. You have the Jays and you have Kemba. So you don't need top-end talent anymore. Yeah. Unless you want to shake, really shake things up. You right. need depth. You need role guys. So, I mean, we, we were talking on the Fee and E podcast a little bit about certain guys, but I think they're going to use it for a couple of guys. They're going to package the deal so they can bring, because right now, if you really look at the Celtics, they only have, look at the playoff, playoff rotations have eight to nine guys. They only trust seven guys. Like, you have the Jays, you have Kemba, Tice, so that's four. Grant Williams, which I think he's becoming one of those consistent guys they feel confident with. Um, not not at the free throw line, but <laughs> with the corner threes, they feel very confident. Smart, and then Pritchard. Even though that uh, Thompson's playing well, they don't feel confident with him. They don't. I mean, last game proved it. He didn't play much in the fourth quarter. And then Teague's been inconsistent. So they need they need two guys to f- kind of fill up that rotation. I think that that's the, ro- the route they're going to go with it. Cause I know people are saying Harrison Barnes, but the Kings have actually gone on a run. I mean, it's kind of looking like that loss to the Kings actually might have not been a bad loss. Cause now they're in the playoffs picture and they've won six of the last seven, they beat the Clippers and everything. So they may actually be pretty good. <laughs> so that loss might not have been bad uh, in hindsight. So I think that they're going to use it. I know that, Al, you made a good point. I'll believe it when I see it. 
but normally they would be rumored for stars because in 16, it was Paul George. And then it was Anthony Davis. It, it feels like they're, and also they kind of box themselves into that. I don't know how you feel with the Ames comments and now this, and especially what happened with the uh, Hayward situation. I feel like they box themselves into it that they have to make a move. Yeah. I mean, they have to, and they're going to make the not sexy move. They're going to make the right move, but, but not sexy, and it's going to piss off a lot of Celtics fans all along. That's my thought. Well, that's okay. As long as you bring some depth, like you said, bring in another shooter, bring in another big man if you need to. If you need to get two shooters, sure, do it. Add some depth. Put yourself in a position where you can truly contend in the East when the playoffs come. Simple. Any other final Celtics thoughts? No. All right, so we're going to go to baseball. No, I, I do want to talk about the Trevor Bauer stuff because I know okay. yeah. I, I, I did want to talk about that. Thoughts on that signing uh, overall, just thoughts on that. Real quick, uh, just to give a shameless plug, but read my blog from earlier today. I wrote a whole <laughs> blog on whether um, Trevor Bauer is worth um, the contract, like Fee said, 40 million year one, 45 year two. And yes, Trevor Bauer is a good pitcher. I think he's above average pitcher, but I don't think he's going to be uh, – just a Cy Young winner year after year, like a DeGrom or someone like that. So I don't really think he's worth that much money. I think he created a bidding war with his marketing, and I think he did everything right to get himself this money and having a career year winning the Cy Young in a contract year was just huge for him. But no, I don't think he's worth the money because you never, like, obviously he has so much science behind what he does, but you never know. He could go three star or be like Kluber, and he, Kluber was rolling in eighteen. And he got a lot or nineteen when he got a liner off the arm and hasn't pit, pitched like two innings since then. So like, there's free stuff that happens, and then the Dodgers just lose all that money. And and if you look at his career stats, he's a career before two thousand twenty is a career four point oh four ERA, and he was. 70 and 60. I know pitching wins don't matter as much anymore, but his career stats are very average compared to a lot of people. So I don't think he's a top of the line pitcher. I think he's a good two or three for the Dodgers rotation. So it's perfect for the Dodgers and they're the best team in baseball. So that just makes them even better, but no, he's not worth the money. How do I put this nicely about Trevor Bauer? however many fans he had before he lost a lot of fans in this free agency process with the t constant tweets. Hey, Boston, what are you up to showing a picture of the ticket at Logan, you know, being in a Yankees hat, basically almost saying to the Mets, Hey, I'm going to sign with you. <laughs> Just kidding. You guys are idiots. I'm not signing with you. Trevor Bauer did not have to go through everything that he did. And the video he made when he went to LA, dude, I get you're excited. You're going home, but like, you're not LeBron James. You're not like Mike Trout in the MLB. You're not, you're not this big guy that you think you are. So the fact that you went to all this trouble to just basically be like, yeah, I'm going to LA good for him for getting his money, but like, come on. Like, and a lot of people will agree that Bauer was interesting before. Like he had a lot of instances off the field, even on the field too, before, now it's like, if you really didn't like Trevor Bauer, then this gives you an, an excuse to completely not like him. So I don't know. That's just me. Um, I've been different with Bauer signing with the Mets or with the Dodgers. He got his money. <laughs> that's a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of money. I, I, I'll focus more on the Dodgers because you guys hit the points, and I, kinda, I agree with both of you. The Dodgers are what any team wants to be especially in baseball, unlimited amount of money and a great farm system where they can get yeah. talent. <laughs> I mean, look, right now they have seven starters for that rotation. They might have to, they might trade somebody to go get another big either bat or arm for the bullpen. They have seven starters. They have seven legitimate starters and five of them would be aces for a majority of baseball. I mean, Walker Bueller. Trevor Bauer, Kershaw, David Price, Dustin May. And I haven't even got to the sixth and seventh spot of Johannes Gray and others. 
they have the deepest rotation of baseball and they have five legit like aces yeah. on the set. They are so deep and then get the lineup and everything. They are now the New York Yankees of the West Coast. They are, they are, they are a, the, the Dodgers might, might go, might screw around when 110 games this year. <laughs> they, they might. So that's how I feel um, on that. Yeah, I just think when I saw that's like, oh, the rich get richer on that one. Yeah. And just like you said, Pete, think about all the players they developed, Bellinger, Bueller, even Kershaw, obviously he's older, but he's a Dodger for life. Like all the guys they have come through their system that they still have and still are playing really, really well. That's a message, John Henry, you keep your homegrown talent. Oh, that, I mean, it, we didn't even mention Luke Galvin. Uh, it just like, they, they're, and they haven't even signed Justin Turner yet. When they get him back in the mix, that team's going to literally go out and might win 110 games. I'm yeah. calling it right now. You can bring me back in a couple of months with their, like, have the best record in baseball. But, yeah, that, I – yeah, they, they, they're they legit. Um, all right. So, we got – any other final thoughts on that? No. No. Nah. All right. Uh, all right. So, we – We've been talking about doing this segment for like, I think a month plus. I think like two, I think like two or three months at this point. Like I've lost track. <laughs> like Al mentioned it and we were like, get to do it. And then things like sight track with it. But we're going to, it was funny because it's like, we were like, yeah, well, let's do it. And then it's like, ah, screw it. Let's not do it. <laughs> but let's do it now because this is a special episode. We're going to do the segment uh, Championship Windows. I know, Al, you know a little bit more about it. So I want, if you want to explain a little more, um, you can. I mean, basically, it's sort of, first of all, first of all, oh, I remember this. It was 98.5, the Sports Hub. They played a game where they basically said, who has the best chance of winning a championship, like, right now, and who's the furthest away from it? So essentially, it's just one through four. You know, we'll do the four major Boston teams. So Red Sox, Patriots, Bruins, Celtics. Um, there were two very interesting lists. It was Tim McCone, and then I forget who the other one was. I think it was like Leroy. I forget his last name off the top of my head, but I follow him on Twitter. I'd have to look it up. But they had two very different lists, so I would be interested to hear your guys' lists on it. I mean, we can start with you, Al. Uh, okay. You're, you're one through four, so we can start okay. there. So right now – and I've, I've switched on this a little bit. So number four, I think right now is the Patriots. I mean, they, I think they're the farthest away right now. Obviously we've talked about it. Quarterback situation needs to be addressed. They need wide receivers. They need tight ends. They need their guys to come back from COVID, which it sounds like they're going to according to Devin McCourty, but it just seems like, especially in their own division, the bills, the dolphins are both good. And the jets, if they make a few moves can also be very good and they have to go through the chiefs. And they have to go through other teams like the Titans and stuff in the AFC. They're a long way right now from winning a championship. So I got Patriots for three. I'm going with, I'm going with the Red Sox at three because I think that they are making the right moves. They still have core, their core in place with JD and Bogarts and Devers. And they're sort of trying to build around that. And they're trying to solidify it. Obviously, you brought back the, the good manager and Alex Cora. So that's my number three. Number two, I'm going with the Celtics because, and we just talked about it. They are a piece or two away from really being in the talk about being a championship contender. I mean, last year, we agreed on this when we talked about it. They blew an opportunity when Milwaukee went down and you faced Miami in the Eastern Conference Finals. Now, granted, would they have beaten the Lakers? Probably not. But that's a chance that that young group had to go to the finals. But they're still in a good position. You have Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown for the next five to seven years. So you have time. And then number one right now, I think, is the Bruins. You know, because they have the good balance of veteran presence with two guys, in Patrice Bergeron and Brad Marchand. And then obviously you have the young superstar up and coming in David Pasternak. Tuka Rask, for all you haters out there, he's one of the best goalies in the game. So stop giving me the Tuka's bad comments. Like, you just sound ridiculous. So, just to recap, Bruins 1, Celtics 2, Red Sox 3, Patriots 4. So, that's my that's my order. All right. Powder? I'm going to have to agree with Al in his order. Um, Patriots just – I just think the NFL is so top-heavy right now, and I think 
they fell off real quick from the top. I think they were at the top with Brady, and then once Brady left, a lot of talent went away, and they're just nowhere. I don't think they're that close. Um, and, like, yeah, their defense, if they do get a good quarterback, I think their defense is close to championship ready, but their offense, they literally have no weapons, so it would be so hard to win. And then the Red Sox, I agree with Al, just pitching-wise, they need more good starting pitcher. Like, yeah, hopefully um, Chris Hill comes back in midsummer and he's good. Hopefully Erod is healthy from COVID and the heart issue and some other guys step up. Like, hopefully Tanner Howe can have – he was good for his three starts. Hopefully he can be consistent. Yeah, obviously I don't think he's going to go 30-0 and 0 this year and be lights out like that. But if he's a good guy who has a – low three ERA and it's good for us. Yeah, that helps the Red Sox then. Like Al said, Celtics are one or two pieces away. Like Fee said, I agree, some depth, some bench players that can really come off the bench and play their roles. And then the Bruins, like we saw right before COVID hit, the Bruins had the best record in the league, had the most points in the league. They were hot. I think if COVID didn't happen, they had a legitimate chance to win the Stanley Cup. So if they can stay hot like they've been doing, the Bruins can definitely win a championship this year, maybe even next year. All right. I'm going to disagree with your list, uh, I'll, but I agree with four. I think the Patriots are the furthest. They don't have a starting quarterback. That's just simple. Forget about everything else. If you don't have a solution, at the key, you're going nowhere in the NFL. So they're four. This is where I disagree. I think three is the Boston Bruins. And the reason, and even though they're off to a fast start, We've kind of seen this song and dance before. Yeah. And the reason why and you got, I know you guys aren't the biggest hockey fans. You're hockey fans, but not the biggest. Right, right, right. They, they don't do enough to get the talent they need. I mean, under Sweeney, they've only got, they've gotten depth pieces when they've needed potentially a legit guy. They went after that legit guy. They overpaid a little bit, but Rick Nash a few years ago. Yeah. And then it kind of burned them a little because he got hurt and it just didn't work out. That's where I put them at three. Yes, they can make a run, but they can get to the East finals or whatever finals that the you NHL's know, made this year. But I just don't, I, th- I think they're a good team and they, and they're going to make a run, but it feels like we've seen the song and swan song again. So that's how I feel about it. Two, I'm going to put the Celtics. And the reason why is, is that they've actually solved the the tough issue in the league? You're, this is it's a league that you need top talent. Yeah, they have top talent, and they're young enough. J- Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, if you do it right, are going to be here for a very long time. I just don't think that even if they get depth pieces, it feels like this is Brooklyn's time. Um, if they can figure out the defensive side of the basketball they can legitimately can score 125 night and you still have LeBron out now. So it's going to, it's not even, you stick to your timeline, you know, that they will win. I think in the next five years, the Celtics will win because I think that they have the talent. I mean, Jason Tatum will be a top 10 player. Jalen Brown probably will be a top 15 player. So you're going to have those guys and you probably might attract another big free agent. That's a big down the line. I don't know who, but just like play with me. Yeah. on that that that's where i think they're going but they're on the right track in the next five years i think the Celtics are going to win a championship it, it's plain and simple but whether we like it or not the red sox are the closest out of any team baseball they have they can spend money in a dime they didn't do it this offseason um which is smart they added a lot of depth they they replenished yeah. their pitching depth and they've gotten some good prospects, um, and the, the, they're making low key signings, and they have a good manager. But next off season, the off season after that, they actually might be the what the Mets were, or what the Dodgers are going to be. That they're going to spend a lot of money to revamp the entire team. I feel like they're the closest because of the Red Sox, and the Red Sox, uh, when they feel like they're close enough to win, they will spend, and they'll spend a lot of money. So that's why I have them at number one, but it just, I would have the Celtics at number one, but it's just the timelines of some other teams. Just you're not there yet because of that, but you're on the right path. So that's fine. A couple notes on the Red Sox that I can see them being number one is 
Next year's free agency class is going to be loaded again, even, I think, better than this year's free agency class. Corey Seager, and depending on Lindor, if he signs extension or not, he'll be a free agent. Um, I know he's a villain in a lot of people, but Carlos Correa is going to be a free agent. The shortstops are loaded. And one note I saw, and I forget who it was, but I saw it on Twitter, that the Rays really wanted Pavetta because they could see him developing into a, a similar type of pitcher like a Tyler Glasnow. Who Pavetta can see that potential. Glasnow is a very – Glasnow needs one more pitch, but he's a very, very top of line, very good top of line pitcher. So if Pavetta can work out like that one person heard that the Rays wanted, why they wanted him, I would love to see that out of a guy that I feel like the Red Sox got for pretty cheap. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's just like they've added their depth, and now the next off season, yeah. like, I mean, granted, it's a deep off season, but for one position that you might not necessarily think it's shortstop. Yeah, could you sign somebody and just say, "All right, we're going to trade Xander Bogarts to go fill out the rest of the deal"? I'm not saying hey, that's a possibility. Right, right, right. Yeah. That's a legit. That's a possibility, but I mean. In that sense, but I think the Red Sox are the closest because it's easier to build up a championship team quicker. But Celtics are on the right path. Bruins, if they make that one big move at the deadline, I might bump them up. And then the Patriots. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> so, so to sort of wrap up, and this is the last thing that we're going to do. Powder, this is a surprise for Mr. Facet. We are going to powder and I are going to give our top moments with Fiesta as a part of this podcast, our favorite moment with Fiesta on this podcast. And Fiesta is going to give us his favorite moment of being on this podcast. And we'll give him some time to think about that because there's one moment to me that sticks out better than the rest. You hear it in the intro, every episode, it was the time that Fiesta bashed Jeremy Jacobs and just went on that absolute rant. I thought that was chef's kiss beautiful that's why we put it in the intro that is my famous favorite thomas facet moment powder um just going off the top of my head is just um maybe not just one moment general but just you and fiesta just always i love the chemistry you guys have going back and forth it's yeah there's been a few times that it's gotten a little heated but it's definitely i think that's what's entertaining about having fiesta on here is he keeps both of us honest and he does. everything like that. So him just having the passion he does, it just shows every episode. All right, Fee, if you can think of one moment, Legends Lingo podcast history, what has been your favorite moment? Oh, I got two. I got two. That's so um, it's the first Dallas Braden interview. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that just that, like, that whole sequence. I'm getting out of class. I finally get on. Dallas ripping me <laughs> and then ripping everybody. Yeah. Just the whole environment, hit, hit the relax. I thought that was one of our best interviews. Um, also, the, the Jerry Thornton one. I thought that was another yeah. good one. A lot of laughs, a lot of good takes uh, on that. So I, I like that a lot. I'll just say I had fun with you guys. Um, the takes, the, the banter uh, on everything. It it was a great time. Down the line, maybe we decide to reunite. Um, that's a story for another day or a topic for a future us to talk yeah. about. But I, I enjoyed the last uh, year plus uh, working with you guys, and it, it it's been an honor. Absolutely, we can say the very same about you. 99% of the time. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, just real quick. Fiesta's made me a better sports fan when coming, starting this podcast, and Al definitely has too, but because Fiesta's leaving, I'll focus on him. But when I'm with my friends, I definitely feel like I'm the smartest sports guy in the room. Like I, from doing this and just being the sports guy I am, when I come on here, I I feel like I know a lot of sports, but you guys push me in Fiesta, especially with numbers. I'm an accountant. I love looking at stats and all that, but like you push me to really make me do more research and understand and know all the stats because you're so good at that stuff. So, like I said, when I'm with my friends, I feel like no one is even close to me with sports knowledge. They all come to me and ask me questions. But 
when I come on here, I just get pushed so much further. Well, there you have it, folks. As always, check out everything, couchguysports.com. Check out the blog. Check out the podcast. Check out the YouTube page. Check out the Twitch page, which we're going to have some big things coming to Twitch coming soon. Manscaped, 20% off and free shipping with the promo code LLP. Mr. Facet, will you take us out one last time, please? And I, I will thank you guys again. We're signing off. Episode 107. Peace, folks. Yes, sir.